Well, we turn with me to the, the 65th Psalm, Psalm 65. Psalm 65 is a psalm of thanksgiving with several other themes in it. Uh, the Jews probably used that during the Festival of Tabernacles. Uh, it is something maybe like our Thanksgiving celebration, but it is celebrated over the course of, of eight days, where they would give God thanks and offer thanksgiving offerings to him. Well, psalm 65 is also a psalm in how we can give thanks to God for his provision. Uh, if you are giving God thanks for the harvest, for the crop, for uh, the livestock, uh, this psalm is also fitting for that. But this psalm goes beyond that point into our need for God in every phase of our lives. In Psalm 65, there is forgiveness. Psalm 65, there is supplication. In Psalm 65, there is thanksgiving that we can give to God. And so if we were to put that together as a general principle in Psalm 65, we can say that because God forgives, restores, and supplies good things, thanksgiving is due him for all that he provides. Because God forgives, restores, and supplies good things, thanksgiving is due to him for all that he provides. Let's read this passage before we look into this and draw principles from it this evening. To the choir master, Psalm of David, a song. A praise is due you, O God, in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. O you who hear a prayer, to you shall all flesh come. When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. And blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell into your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. By awesome deeds, you answer us with righteousness. O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the Father seas, the one who by his strength established the mountains being girded with might, who stills the warring of the seas, the roaring of the waves, the tumult of the people, so that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe at your signs. You make the going out of the morning and the evening to shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, for so you have prepared it. You water, it for us. You water its furrows abundantly, uh, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with abundance. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. Well, beloved, the worshiper's fruit of thanksgiving is what we're looking at. As, as we gaze on God's provision uh, in the forgiveness of sin and just the day-to-day -day graces that he grants to us, uh, the worshiper's fruit of thanksgiving to God declares, first of all, that God satisfies, that God satisfies. When we give thanks to God, we're acknowledging that our satisfaction comes from him because he provides for us everything that we need. We find that to be true in this uh, very beginning of verse 1 when it says that praise is due to you. Uh, the ESV adopts a common translation for this, but in the NASB, for example, it says that there will be praise before you, or there will be a silence before you and praise in Zion, O God. Unto you the vow shall be performed. Uh, the original word is believed to be the word silence uh, that should be applied to this translation. But the meaning of that silence needs to match the praise that will follow because it is a commitment to praise God, and it does. The silence here in verse 1 is an expression of confidence in God. And the people are confident that God has answered and that God will answer. In fact, when you think of Psalm 65, verse 1, it says, For God alone my soul waits in silence. Uh, from him comes my salvation. And so this, this expression of silent confidence and uh, the willingness and the readiness to praise God is an anticipation that God will answer. And so in verse 1, the vows offered to God in this context is a commitment to offer thanksgiving to God to whom that thanksgiving is due and to sing songs of praise to him, to sacrifice sacrifices of thanksgiving to God. But this longing in verse 1 is also there 
the silent confidence uh, comes with a longing to publicly acknowledge God's answer to their prayer and to make known His kindness to them. But notice what the psalmist says in verse 2. It's another statement of confidence that God is a God who hears the prayers of His people. It says, O oh, you who hear prayer, to you all flesh shall come. And so the God who hears in this psalm is the God who answers prayers. And we know that God is a speaking God, but God is also the God who hears. And the word for prayer here is a, is a broad way to describe various forms of prayer. As it can, a prayer some prayers can be sung, uh, some prayers can be recited, some can be spoken. It is okay to have a prayer that you may write out because prayers are written. You have recorded prayers in the Bible. And so it is okay to write out your prayers. They are also good to have prayers that are, are spontaneous, as it were, are in the moment. But you have various forms of prayer that this means. Oh, God who hears the various prayers of his saints, those who are singing it, speaking it. Uh, you may have also prayers of intercession, uh, prayers of thanksgiving involved in that. And in some instances, prayers are born out of distress. In the very distress of that moment, you're crying out to God who hears, and God hears that also. The psalmist recognizes that God is faithful to hear the prayers of his saints and also to answer. But notice what you have in this. You look at verse 3 in this passage. You have a God who hears the prayers of the distressed one who is distressed over sin. This is very important to recognize. The psalmist says that to God all flesh will come to him, but in verse 3 he also speaks of iniquity. This is important for us to consider, beloved. The word flesh in verse 2 represents people in general, but more specifically it is a reference to our natural makeup that we are people who are in need. We have a common need, and the need is for God to help us. But not only that, the statement here in verse 2 is a statement about the future. To you shall all flesh come. Those who believe and trust God know that they should do so at this point in time. In the future, more will come to recognize this. And so those of us who recognize, acknowledge that now we go to God, in the future God will continue to draw us sinners to himself. But listen to the insights from God's Word, beloved, that the answer to our prayers are not for our achievement. The answer to our prayers and God hearing them are not for the world uh, to see that our prayers are effective. The answer to our prayers, they are for the world to see that God is the one who is at work, that God is working to meet the needs of His people. The answer to prayer is for us to recognize and acknowledge God, but for others to recognize and acknowledge that God is at work when we confess and make known that God has so graciously heard the prayers of His feeble saints. Oh, what this does, this opens the door for uh, the onlookers and the observers to ask questions about God. In fact, the people of God were in the habit of, of recording events. Uh, recording events and circumstances that took place. And they did so, and they recorded uh, what God did, and in doing so, it caused others to take notice as they recorded what God did and God's answer to prayer. It was a recorded event so that the world could recognize, to listen, to hear, and to worship God. They would come to know that it's in God's nature to answer prayer as we convey to them that God heard us. And so the, the God who hears prayer, it is a blessing that God hears our prayers, but it's not our prayer such as it, as it is God's faithfulness to answer, because it is in God's nature to answer the prayers of His people. It is in His nature to perform marvelous deeds for His people, not because we deserve it, which we know that is not true, but it's because God is willing to do so. People like John Calvin would say the answer of our prayers is secured by the fact that in rejoicing or that in rejecting them, that in rejecting our prayers, God would in a sense would deny his own nature. 
The answer of our prayers is secured by the fact that in rejecting them, God would in a certain sense deny his own nature. Or it was David Dixon who said this, the hearing and granting of prayer are the Lord's property and his usual practice and his pleasure and his nature and his glory. This is about God. This is about God's goodness, his faithfulness in responding to his people's uh, prayer. It is comforting uh, for us to know that when we come to God in prayer, it is his honor to bestow his blessing on his saints. And so he eagerly awaits to hear our prayers, our petitions, and our cries to him. But now when you look at verse 2 and and you look at verse 3, pay attention to the relationship between the two. This is the God who hears the prayers of of the saints. But then in verse 3, it says, when iniquities prevail against me. So not only does God hear the prayers, but God, he says in verse 3, that God atones for our transgressions. The idea here is uh, the matters of iniquities. So it's not just iniquities, but the matter, the topic concerning iniquities and the iniquities that we commit. The psalmist says, when iniquities prevail against me, or another translation, when iniquities overwhelm me. As for God's people, he's faithful. He hears them. He is kind, and he answers them. They're blessed with his goodness, but here they're overwhelmed by iniquities. They have sinned so greatly and are overwhelmed by their sin. To remain in this state will be discouraging. It will breach the fellowship between them and God. If God does not resolve it, his when the psalmist says, yes, God does. But here you have God's intolerance for sin, God who hates sin, God who despises sin, he's never pleased with it. But the psalmist says that God is able to graciously atone for, for that sin. Now, the ancient meaning for the word atone varied. It could mean a cover, to smear, or in the sacrificial system to make amends, uh, to atone for a wrong that was done. Our English explanation combines the word at, atonement, and one uh, to, un- to unite us or to make us one or to unite us with God. That is also a good a way to look at it. But also we have the contemporary equivalent word for reconciliation. And that all fits into the picture here that only God can atone, only God can reconcile, only God can unite, can unite us, only God can atone for our sins, only God can blot out our transgressions. The psalmist says, when it prevails against me, you atone for our transgression. Well, that is true for those who are in Christ Jesus. We know this to be true. But there's something very clear in this text that the psalmist articulates. If you were following along as I read this passage, there were a lot of statements directed toward God. This pronoun was directed toward God. Praises for you is to do you. To you shall vows be performed. O you who hear the prayer, to you shall all flesh come. And then in verse 3, when iniquities prevail against me, you atone. But it says you, you atone. Or it's one way of saying you alone atone. So it's very emphatic. But the Old Testament believers did not accept the sacrificial system as their way. Uh, they believed that it was God who forgave them of their transgressions and not the deeds that they have done. God alone can forgive. God alone can remove. Only God can blot the sin away. That separates the Creator from His creation. And here in this text, the psalmist makes less of a reference to the animal, or the animal sacrifice would be included as an act and as a symbol of God's work and their obedience to what God command. But he speaks specifically about something that only God can do, and that is only God can lift that sin. Only God, by His grace, can remove this breach that sin caused. And it was Spurgeon who said that our, sin, our sins would but for grace prevail against us in the court of divine justice in the court of conscience and, conscience and in the battle of life. But the psalmist says God atones for it. Well, that text brings to our mind this truth, though, beloved, that sin and our sin should overwhelm us, but it should not condemn us. Our sin should turn our hearts and affections to Christ who died for our sins and rose for our justification. 
The psalmist goes on in verse 4 to say, Blessed is the one you choose to bring near, to dwell in your courts. Uh, we will be satisfied with the goodness of your house and the holiness of your temple. And so the satisfaction of being in God's presence and the confidence that he hears uh, those whom he has chosen to be in special relationship with him, there is joy that is involved, that God has chosen to bring a sinners into fellowship with himself and into worship with him. But that comes at the heels of God atoning for transgression. But then in verse 4, you see the sovereign work of God in choosing and bringing us near to himself. So the deeper satisfaction really is not what you and I may receive materially or the psalmist will reflect on God's bounty in the material world and material things, but it is to have God. It's to be forgiven of our trespasses and sins. And the psalmist says, blessed is the one you choose. So this is God's choice. And you bring near. This is God's doing that he elects sinners to salvation, grants them access to his presence. But notice what the new covenant truth also reminds us of. Something very similar mirrors what is said in Psalm 65. In Romans 5, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Psalm 36, verse 9 says, For with you is the fountain of light, life, in your light we see light. And so these acts are according to God's will. And he has blessed us. Something else to consider in verse 4, that if God has blessed us, it follows that we did not deserve the blessings that he's given to us. What has preceded this blessing is the overwhelming reality of our transgressions. But then the benefit of God's goodness toward us is that he still blesses us. But our iniquity, although it may separate us from him temporarily, it does not separate us from him finally. The psalmist says, how blessed is the one whom God chooses and draws to himself. To worship him, to dwell in worship, and to be in his presence in worship. Well, Psalm 32 verses 1 through 2 is also mirrored and echoed in Romans chapter 4, but Psalm 32, blessed is the one, or how blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. And blessed is the man whom the Lord counts no iniquity. And in, in Romans 4, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Well, back in Psalm 65, the psalmist says God graciously calls us to a place of worship with Him. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. And the word dwelling speaks of, of a temporal dwelling. It doesn't mean that believers do not have fellowship beyond that, but I believe the reference here has to do with the corporate worship. So this is one of God's gracious invitations. It is a call for God's people to dwell with Him in worship. Now, think about this, beloved. They are there because God has chosen them and brought them in to dwell and to be with Him in worship. They're there because He has forgiven their sins. Now, think about that and think about the invitation. And ask yourself if the invitation to dwell in God's uh, house or to worship with the congregation is optional for the saint. If God has chosen us, but also called us to dwell and to worship with Him, and I believe this, this is a temporal aspect of worship, which means it's the time we set aside uh, to, to gather with God's people, if this is optional for the saint. Well, if this was under the Old Covenant, do you think this is an Old Covenant truth or a command? It is not. In fact, Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians that the Old Covenant was, was a ministry of death, but it was glorious. How much more is the ministry of life under the New Covenant? Well, the New Covenant speaks of Christ. Well, beloved, 
we should give more thought and consideration now uh, to the blessing, but also the prize of our corporate gathering. That to be forgiven and to be blessed is to be brought not only to the presence of God in fellowship, but also into the presence of God in corporate worship with His people. This is a prize that the psalmist cherishes earnestly. And it is true that some are unfaithful in their attendance in the place of worship. They may pick days and times to come as if it is something of convenience, but that is clearly a sign of unbelief. Because, listen, corporate worship is an invitation from God. It is an invitation from God because this truth and this principle extends into the new covenant life of the believer. For one, it is a testament to God's grace to forgive. We're here tonight because we are forgiven. We're here tonight because we have been reconciled to God. And when we gather corporately, it, it testifies to that truth. We're here because we have been granted eternal fellowship in Christ with God. And so this, this truth that God has called us into His courts in the Old Testament Scripture, it also applies to the New Testament believers. But here's what the psalmist says. The psalmist says that there's satisfaction there in verse for we shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your place of worship, your tabernacle or temple, or wherever that may be. This statement is a statement of confidence that when God's people gathered to hear what God had to say from His Word, to sing God's truth, to give Him thanks, they were confident that they were going to receive something good from God. But why come if you're not going to? Why attend if you're not confident that God will speak something so profound to you from His Word? But God's people believe that. This is a statement of confidence. We, we know that we'll be satisfied with the goodness of your house. Because God will be there. And they know that they'll receive something from God because His goodness will satisfy them. God's goodness and how God has displayed His goodness toward them, it will satisfy them. And in that satisfaction, they're able to give God all of the praise and the glory. So the people are confident here that they will come and they will enjoy God. He has dealt with them so kindly. He's judged them in righteousness, but He extends mercy in His grace to forgive them. They're saying that we will be satisfied in your presence, and they're saying this with confidence. Now, beloved, think about the blessed new covenant that we have in Christ. That Christ is this new and living way. But notice how the writer in Hebrews combines worshiping corporately and how he combines it with what God has done through the Lord Jesus Christ and how that is to affect our gathering as believers. Hebrews 10, verse 19 Beginning there, therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of, of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, listen to this, beloved, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with water. Let us hold fast. Let us be confident here. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promises faithful. You say, well, Jesus Christ is a new living way. I can worship him where I'm at home. I can do it in my car. I don't have to be with the, the congregation. It's all done away with. Christ is all I need. Well, listen, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. How? Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. 
But listen carefully to this also. But encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. When God's people congregated, even in the Psalms, it was a time for them to rejoice, but to encourage one another, uh, to instill confidence in each other, to remind the fellow brothers and sisters in Christ of God's goodness to them. That was done in, in the Psalms. It was done in the early life of the church. It's to be done today. The psalmist says, we'll be satisfied. And have you ever attended a place of worship and you come with, with all the wrong thoughts in your mind and God graciously brings you back to where your thoughts ought to be? And you say, well, that could have happened from home. Yes, but he's chosen to do it here when believers gather. The preaching you say, well, the preaching didn't quite appeal to me today. Sorry, I'll work harder next week or next month. But then someone, after the service, you see them in fellowship, you speak with them, and God uses them to encourage you and to build you up and to edify you and to get your mind focused on the day that is drawing near. So then your satisfaction returns back to God. When you gather in a place of worship, those who do not will grow in sinful dissatisfaction. Now listen, if we can stay away from the place of worship, if we can remove ourselves from prayer and the Word of God, beloved, there's a lot of death there. There's more death there than there is life. But now when you come to the place of worship, you're reminded of this. Now listen, beloved, please listen to me. If you are guilty of this, the best thing you can do is to admit your guilt and acknowledge that to God and let Him know that you have, have failed to be actively involved in the place of worship, the gathering of the saints, or you fail failed to be actively involved in your prayer to God or the Scripture that reminds you of God's goodness and His faithfulness. If not, then your satisfaction is going to drift over to everything else in life that was not designed to satisfy you. For those who believe in God, we can be satisfied with God's material provision the right way because our satisfaction begins with God First of all, and supremely, in everything that he gives us, we can give thanks to him and enjoy it. Thanksgiving is coming up relatively soon. And your thought ought to be, how can I give God thanks during that time? Now, beloved, thanksgiving to God is not to give God thanks for the spread, and then when you're done, you can either talk, move, breathe, or speak. But you've been paralyzed by the food present, presented before you. That's not thanksgiving to God. Thanksgiving to God is to give Him praise for His provision and to handle His provision responsibly and thankfully. And so, gluttony is not an act of thanksgiving. To say you've overeaten, I pray that your iniquities overwhelm you. I pray that you will live in verse 3 long enough to recognize that that is not a virtue from God. Now, there is a way, in reality, beloved, there is a way to enjoy these bounties from God if they're done appropriately. But it's striking that Christians can actually make these comments and not think twice of it that it's a disservice to true biblical thanksgiving. Now, to say that, man, I, I ate so much that I feel like a stuffed pig. And the stuff picked has never moved an inch that I, that I can tell. No, beloved, true thanksgiving to God appropriates all of these blessings the right way. Well, God satisfies, does he not? The worshiper's fruit of thanksgiving to God is to confess and declare that God satisfies. And in verses 5 through 8 is to declare that God sustains, that God sustains. It says... By awesome deeds, you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the further seas. 
The one who by strength established the mountains, being girded with might, who stills the roaring of the seas, the, the roaring of the waves, the tumult of the peoples, so that those, and listen to verse 8, so that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe at your signs. You see that, beloved? That this, this is the result or the intent or the purpose. So that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe, awe at your signs. So all that God is doing presently, the church, the believers, the Old Testament believers, the New Testament believers ascribe this all to God because we want to resonate this truth so that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe at His signs. So this is for God. We declare that God sustains so that those who dwell at the ends of the earth may stand in awe. Well, in verse 5, it is God who upholds all things by the word of His power, and we're called to consider that. But the psalmist says that by your awesome deeds, you answer according to your character. That's really what he's saying here, that God answers really in righteousness, which God answers according to His divine attributes. Therefore, God is perfectly good and perfectly righteous, and so every answer that God gives is according to His perfect uprightness. So the call is for us to recollect, to reflect, to think on God's deeds. But also, His deeds is to bring a certain and a necessary fear. And this fear is right, because this fear is in relation to God's deeds done in righteousness. And so God's deeds are not sporadic or temperamental. They are according to His divine perfection. God rules in righteousness because He is righteous. He can't rule any other way. And that is what the, the believer is called to hold fast to. This sense of fear, though, should strike dread in those who are in unbelief. For His worshipers, it should be a sense of holy reverence for God. So this fear is appropriate. It says you do so. In righteousness, but notice what the psalmist says, you answer us. It is God who answers. It is you who answer us, O God of our salvation. And so the deeds done are awesome deeds that God is doing, but also he says that you, you alone are our deliverer, you alone are our salvation. So when the people of God came to the designated place of worship, they would speak of the goodness of God, because that's the only way to actually rightly describe God. He is good. He is righteous. He is faithful. He is kind. He is merciful. But where would they get that from? They'll just make these things. No, no, God revealed it to them. They would read the Word of God, pray the Word of God, preach from the Word of God, and pray according to the Word of God. And when they gathered, they would hear of God's acts and deeds done in righteousness. They would hear of God's forgiveness and His faithfulness to forgive. They would hear of God's uh, call uh, to worship and to honor Him. They would hear of God's atoning mercy for their sins and that God does this and it's all in harmony with His name and nature. And so the people would meet to declare that God's deeds are in harmony with who He is. They will not be celebrating themselves. They will not be celebrating accomplishments. They will be celebrating the goodness of God because it reminds them of who God is. But then in verses 6 through 7, God's people were confident that He exercises full control. The God who sustains is exercising full control over creation because it all belongs to Him. It's God by His strength who established the mountains, being girded with might. And so the totality of God's power is the sense you find here in verse 6, where the mountains are a picture of stability. But also in verse 7, even the seas, although they may seem to be rebellious or pouring on the shores, the psalmist says God controls the seas and the roaring of the waves. He controls it. And so if the mountains are symbols of stability and the seas are symbols of instability, God controls that also. 
But then that leads up to the third line that God controls the people. The nations, that is. <clears throat> so God is exercising His control over all of creation. And of course, the peoples here is a reference to the diverse ethnicities. So this is going go global, that God is in control uh, over the nations. And so the psalmist envisions this. He sees this. He knows this to be true. And it leads up to the purpose in verse 8, so that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe at your signs. Now, beloved, think about that for a moment and then think about your prayers to God. Think about your desires for God to work. Is it so that God may be glorified to the ends of the earth? Or are you looking for just common relief? Relief is not a sinful thing. <clears throat> But if it's the ultimate goal, it is. The ultimate goal for every answered prayer so that we may declare and see God's grace on display. So that we have something always to say to the world, this is God at work, he's always at work, he's faithful. The answer for prayer is so that we can give God glory from our lips, but also give God glory publicly before others so that we may point to him and point to Christ. <clears throat> and that is what verse 8 is saying. We want the world to be in awe at what you're doing, at your signs, your salvation, the, the, the evidence of your answer to our prayers, your deeds done in righteousness, your power in creation. We want it all to point to you. In fact, Colossians 1, 15 through 17 reminds us that Jesus Christ is the head of all things, and in him, in him all things are held together. Beloved, our goal is so that the Christ and his majesty may be seen, so that the world may ask, who is this Christ? Now, we know that these signs will not save anyone. Christ did many signs that did not save them, but they opened up the door for those to see, to believe, or to ask questions. There's a great display to the world of God's goodness. But the question must be that when God responds, when God redeems, when God saves, when God forgives, do we tell the world of God's goodness? When God graciously responds to our prayers, well, do we even remember them? Do we record them and, and do we remember them? And when we do, do we let others know that God's faithfulness has always been without question? And here is additional proof of it, as God so graciously heard the prayer of this feeble saint. When you think about these, these signs, being in awe of these signs, just think of these signs serving like road markers. If the Christian, if we're using these road markers well, the road markers to the answer to our prayer should point to not how well we pray, not that someone says, wow, you articulate that prayer so well. No wonder God answers your prayer. And you said, well, you know, I had to learn that over the years. No, that's, you have failed to really articulate to them how those prayers are answered and why. In God's faithfulness, he's chosen to do so. But remember, you have the Holy Spirit who intercedes for you in Romans 8, so your prayers are not all that spectacular. You have the great intercessor, Jesus Christ, and you also have the indwelling intercessor of the Holy Spirit. You need plenty of help from heaven. And God who says, yeah, just send it up my way, but purify it first. He's so good. He's so kind. It is God's goodness. Those markers to the answer of, to our prayers should point to God. Now you say, well, I pray, but I don't know if I get, receive any answers to my prayer. You do. You probably don't record them. Or the reason for your prayer is selfish and sinful. But beloved, remember this. God answers every prayer. And so a, a no is an answer. A no is an answer. But there should always be markers pointing us and pointing others to God. So when God answers, when God hears, when God forgives, you do not teach the people the power of making a good confession. You don't do that, do you? When you speak of God's forgiveness, say, well, God forgive you, say, yeah, you just got to know how to say it. 
You got to know how to ask. You got to say the right words. No, if you confess your sins, He is the one who's faithful and just. Not your faithfulness to articulate it, but His faithfulness to forgive you. Well, the same is true in your prayer. God responds humbly, confess that it is His faithfulness. Let me take Him to, let me take you to Him. Let me take you to the Lord. But the psalmist continues to say that this is God who sustains you. Make the going out of the morning and the evening to shout for joy. That is the end of verse 8. So as creation silently praises God, when we view creation, we too can praise God. When we see God's provision, we're able to praise God. But the psalmist says that these acts of praises are happening all over the world. Where the day dawns, the sun sets, people everywhere are praising God. Creation is given evidence to God's glory. In fact, the, the truth of the matter is that when you think of this, the gospel being spread throughout the nations today, there are men and women all over the world praising God, responding to the gospel. Wherever the gospel is proclaimed in regions known and unknown, God is being praised. When we rest our heads and when we lay down there, songs of praises in every place being sung to God. There's some people who enjoy the fellowship so much that Sunday isn't enough for them. That they long to meet with the brethren throughout the week so they continue to sing praises to God for His work of salvation. The beginning of this praise, O oh beloved, it comes from God's people spreading throughout the world that we're acknowledging that God is the one who sustains his creation. God satisfies in verses 1 through 4. God sustains in verses 5 through 8. And that is the fruit of our thanksgiving. We're declaring that, God, this is what you are doing. This is who you are. You are the God who satisfies. You are the God who sustains. But also in verses 9 through 13, it is that God supplies. And we give thanks to God. The fruit of our thanksgiving declares that God supplies. And in verses 9 through 13, the psalmist focuses on the material things, God's life-sustaining blessings, that God's care appears, and it, it is readily seen in His daily display of grace. It says in verse 9, you visit the earth and water it, you greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water, you provide their grain, for so you have prepared it. And so when God responds to provide the needs of His people, it is there his people praise him for his care. The psalmist says the rain comes from God. And you can, you can take your scientific explanation all you want. At the end of the day, I'll always be right either way God did it. You can talk about the clouds, the various clouds. That's, that's beautiful. I love to hear my children talk about those things. And then at the end of it, I says, well, praise God. It's all from him. It is good to know the nuances of creation, but at the end of the day, it comes from the Creator. Well, here the psalmist says that God is actively involved. This is the active, living providence of God. They planted, but it was God who provided. And of course, we know the old covenant blessings came when those who obeyed received the blessings. They were cursing for those who disobeyed. And the psalmist, he's aware of this, but he focuses here more on God's goodness in general. God's deeds toward them. And they're giving thanks to God for the rain. The crops are growing, the crops are harvested. The harvest is in abundance. God created the ground, the material, the nutrients, and all that it needed, and God has also supplied the rain. And we may have sprinkler systems and irrigation systems that are, are useful, but I tell you, nothing waters the soil like the rain from the heavens. The psalmist says the river of God is full of water. And he's saying that the water is his supply. He sends the water from the heavens. And that the harvest also comes from him because he prepared the land for, for the grain. And you look at verses 10 through 13, that the blessing of the crops and the livestock, it is also from God. 
You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges in verse 10, softening it with waters and blessing it with growth, or blessing its growth. And of course, you know that the land in Israel had harsh summers. The heat would dry the land, harden the soil, and the psalmist says that God sends the rain. And of course, if you didn't see rain for a long period of time, you would be more thankful when it comes and you see the land restored and you see the land livened again or enlivened again. And the psalmist says that God is praised for preparing the land with water and blessing the land to produce. Oh, you know, they didn't really have knowledge as we do today on how things grow. We know how things when we still have droughts here. Beloved, because it all comes from God. The minerals, the nutrients. And we're learning about the soil that over the years we may have actually affected the soil negatively uh, by some of the things that we have done, but that God created the soil naturally uh, to recuperate, uh, to reproduce, uh, to replenish itself. <clears throat> it is all from God. You know, funny thing is this. It's all going back to creation. It's all going back to what God did. It's all going back to what God said. And so the people of God here may have planted, they may have irrigated, they may have labored. But they knew this, a man may plant, another may water, but there's no growth if God says no growth. It is not human ingenuity or skill, it is God. For us, beloved, it's a grave sin to assume that our hand or power achieved anything. Naturally or spiritually, because in this text you have the spiritual aspects of, of forgiveness and the fellowship with God, and also the natural provision. The psalmist says, it is not in our power to gain access to any of these things. It is God who graciously gives them to us. Verse 11 says, you crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with abundance. It all comes from God. Even the labor uh, is His provision. He says the bounty overflows, that you bless us with more than enough. And in verse 11, the harvest is so successful that the people could not help but rejoice in God because they knew this was from Him. They knew this was from Him. The NASB says, you have crowned the year with your bounty, and your paths drip with fatness. And this is most likely a picture of the harvest. There's an overflow in the harvest or from the harvest. There's more than enough for us to eat and to enjoy. God has given us plenty. But then in verse 12, God's harvest of blessing and material things continues. It goes from the crops to the livestock. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. It means the animal, the livestock, they can also eat. And at the end of each season, we have this opportunity to thank God because once the hills were lifeless, they were dry, there was a famine, the animals would leave and wander into other places to find food. But here God supplies and the hills that were previously lacking in water are now showing signs of life. We see this in California. We really have some dry seasons. And then we may have a very brief period of rain, and all of a sudden, a day or two later, things are so green, upright, lively. The psalmist says it's God who clothes that what was once dry with life and with joy. This is the psalmist's theocentric view of God's creation and provision, that God causes the hills to shout for joy when He nourishes them with life and sustains them. But it goes into the meadows. He clothes them with flocks in verse 13. The valleys deck themselves with grain. <clears throat> they shout and sing together for joy. The grain overflowing and the shouting and singing really is a personification that when the land produces because of God's provision, it's as if they're shouting and singing to God. But beloved, that image is true for the worshiper that we give God thanks for His provision. We know that everything comes from Him. When we uh, sit and we pray over a meal, we're acknowledging that this comes from God, not from our hand, but from God's gracious hand, from God's blessing, 
and from God's provision. And so as creation is personified as doing so, we are literally doing so with creation, giving God praise and thanks for his provision. But beloved, how much more should we do so when we think about the eternal life that we have, forgiveness of sin? But then the bonus is that we're able to look at this life, see God's provision, and give him thanks because we know that this is his goodness to us. But then the question is, why should the fruit of your thanksgiving matter? Because when you give God thanks, because he alone satisfies, sustains, and supplies, you're thanking him because you know that only he can provide those things, that it all comes from him and him alone. But think about Colossians 1, verses 15 through 17, when it speaks about Christ, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by, a thing, by him, for by him all things were created. In heaven, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. When you give God thanks for his provision in satisfying and sustaining and supplying, you're acknowledging that in Christ all things are being held in its rightful place. There's some reflections I want to provide for you, beloved, just for us to summarize our study in Psalm 65, and one of them has to do with prayer. The psalmist says in verse 2, O you who hear prayer. And that is an encouraging truth for the Christian, that God hears, graciously hears, and responds to the prayers of his people. Then the question that you must ask yourself is, how is this fleshed out in your life? What is your your life and and your convictions of prayer like? Not necessarily how often, but what is your attitude of prayer? Scripture reminds us that we should pray without ceasing. We should always be in the attitude and the readiness for prayer. Is that true, beloved, of you and your life? As you're driving, preferably and and only with your eyes open. (laughs) Are you praying to God? Pouring out your thoughts to God. When you're at home doing your time in His Word, is that the only thing you do is to read the Scripture? Or do you spend time praying to God? As I've reminded you before, Those who pray to God really believe that he hears and answers. Those who do not pray to God do not believe that he hears and answers. If you really believe that God hears and answers, you'll be praying because this is the sovereign ruler over all creation. Ah, but you say, I have a counter argument. I haven't been praying and things have been working out well. That's mercy. But on your part, that's also mockery because you've despised the command that God has given you and also the joy of praying to him. So now you're mocking God and you're saying, nah, it's worked out for me pretty good. I just read your word, God, and I don't even pray and you still work. It's mockery. But those who believe, beloved, remember, believe that prayer and the word are seen walking side by side in the will of God. But also there's the importance of petitioning to God Taking your needs to God, you see the petition here, I believe it is connected to the acknowledging of sin. We're going before the Lord's table this evening. It's so important for us to remember this, to acknowledge our sins before God, acknowledge our transgressions before Him and to Him. We know we have fellowship with Him constantly because of Christ. He's brought us near because of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when we petition to God, beloved, Don't sweep your sins under the rug. Confess those sins so that you can enjoy the blessings of the fellowship that you have with him. But thirdly, remember the importance of praise. There's prayer, petition, and praise. Beloved, we must be characterized as a people who give thanks to God. Thanksgiving is such a vital part of the Christian's life. We need to cultivate that habit of giving God thanks. Now, how do we do so? 
Simple, simple to do so in everything. In every circumstance, give thanks. That means there's not a moment in life, not a period in time, not an event throughout life where you cannot give God thanks. If you practice that, beloved, you're practicing what the psalmist and the believers would do. They would give God thanks oftentimes before the answer because they trusted in Him and His Word. But on some general points of application, beloved, this is something for you to, to do regularly as you look at this text. Verse 8, so that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe of your signs, that we should be people ready to compel sinners to hear and know of God's goodness. We know that we must declare their guilt and their sin, but they should know of God's goodness and, and His mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ. They should also be aware in some way that all of your provision comes from Him. The world says we worked hard. Believers say God has labored graciously in Christ to bless me with everything that I have. I deserve nothing. That's what the Christian says because we want to point to Christ. But as an application, growing the habit of confessing your sins, the habit of confessing your sins, do so. This is a humbling place to be, but it is richly richly rewarding because you're reminded of your human frailty more often in confessing your sins and acknowledging your strengths. But I would say thirdly, model gratefulness. Model gratefulness. Practice the attitude and the expression of thanksgiving to God. Over a meal, you give thanks to God, even for our young ones, to cultivate that is a work of the Spirit of God because as soon as they see Junior next to them, they're like, Junior has more than me. But then I wonder who they learned that from. Model gratefulness that whatever we have, whether it be little or much, it is God's gracious provision to us. We go before the Lord's table, beloved, and we know that this is a symbol, a representation of God's great provision in Christ. If you say, well, it's hard to be thankful for other things, beloved, this is it. This is it. This is a place of, of true and the height and the apex of gratitude that God has sent Christ, His Son, for us.